Well, welcome everybody. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Reverend Fred Harrell to our group today. Um, he is a, um, a liberal left-leaning uh, reverend out in San Francisco. Um, and we are especially curious to hear what he has to say because we come from a very conservative background as Assyrians where um, you know, our church has began to lean more and more to the right and it seems to no longer align with a lot of our values. And we'd love to hear from uh, a religious uh, organization that does align more with our values. And so I wanna give the floor to Reverend Harrell and have him introduce himself and share his thoughts. All right, thank you very much. It's uh, really great to be with you this evening. Um, so yes, my name is Fred Harrell. Um, 25 years ago, I moved to San Francisco and started a new congregation. Um, and so that's how long we've been in the city. Um, tonight, I'm going to be speaking as a Christian pastor. So I'm not a politician. Uh, I don't want to be one. Um, however, I will say that the gospel of Jesus Christ is inherently political. Um, when Syriac Christians dating back to the early stage of the church, as you all well know, confess things like Jesus is Lord, they were self-consciously saying that Caesar is not. In fact, most of the early names of Jesus were politically subversive and were a counter to the imperial propaganda of the day. So Caesar was called all the things Jesus was called, Savior, Son of God, Lord. And the earliest Christians said, no, Jesus actually is all of those things, not Caesar. So people who want a Christianity free from politics, I don't think the early follower of Jesus who risked their lives to say Jesus is Lord would, I think they would beg to differ. So that being said, I'll try not to preach tonight, I promise. <laughs> I'm simply just going to share my story with some lessons along the way that I think might be helpful. I hope they would be, but uh, it's an honor to be with you and I trust our time will be well spent together. So let me bore you a little bit. Um, with my own personal background, um, but I think it goes to our whole goal here of how do we get from a more traditional space to a more progressive space, but without throwing out the tradition. Uh, in other words, how do we transcend our tradition, but include it as well, which is a very important distinction. And what I say about my, my uh, particular foundation is it was a, as a foundation um, of listening um, with a goal of love. So you're gonna hear that a lot tonight, listening and love. So I was born in Central Florida, uh, rural Central Florida, um, about as white bread, white skinned country boy as it gets. I lived in the part of Florida that's actually wall to wall orange groves. Um, at least they were in those days. Um, I, uh, I'm 59 years old and I'm, I'm at the point where I like to joke with my younger congregants that I was, I was born back in the 1900s. So, um, white people lived on one side of town, black folks lived on the other definitively. My father was a little different though. He employed black folks. He was the first white man I recall who treated black folks with dignity, empathy, and respect. His funeral was probably the most integrated funeral uh, Lakeland, Florida, my hometown has ever seen up to that point. And I think the best thing my dad imparted to me was curiosity and the need to change and evolve over one's lifetime. The need to listen to outside voices. Um, he was successful. Uh, yeah, he was successful because of his privilege um, as a white man, uh, but also because he was courageous to change multiple times in the face of a lot of people thinking he was crazy. And I've learned that's normal operational pr procedure for people who insist on growing and evolving. It's not always appreciated by other people. I'm sure some of you have felt that very same sting. It's threatening to the status quo. People don't like that. It's what Jesus got, what put Jesus on a cross. Listening and staying curious can get you in trouble, but I think it's good trouble, as John Lewis, my, our civil rights hero, would say. So my church upbringing was actually pretty healthy in many ways. It was simple. Uh, love everybody. God is love. Love people in need. Welcome the stranger. Very simple. Um, my church, believe it or not, was a Southern Baptist church that threw open its doors for all the Cuban refugees that were flooding Florida back in the 50s and 60s, the 60s and 70s. Um, there was no fear mongering about immigrants. We needed them, they needed us. Hard to believe that today, I know. Again, simple. My mother was involved actually in helping these Cuban refugees learn English. 
And um, our reflex was simple, love people. If anything gets in the way of that, it needs to be dealt with because we all need to love each other. It's all simple to me anyway. One of those ladies that my mom taught English to had a daughter who my mom remembers seeing run around with all the other little Cuban boys and girls. Her name was Torelli and we've been married for 35 years. So culture, as you all know, is often experienced through food and my palate grew significantly along with the times of days that I would eat because they eat at all times of the day. <laughs> because in a Cuban household, the door is always open, the kitchen is always open and certainly cafe con leche is always flowing. My and my uh, we dated my wife and I dated for three and a half years and I had to have her in at 1030 every night we went out up until the day we got married 1030 at night. And I learned that she wasn't a typical American girl because I would criticize her mother and her response was to say you don't criticize my mother. <laughs> so it was quite the uh, jolt for me. But we'd get in at 10.30 only to have another meal at 11, followed by Domino's until 2 p.m. with whoever knocked on the door with kids in tow. And I tell you all of that because all of that was reshaping my own understanding of hospitality um, and rules for when people could come over or not. We're all just now seen as you know, through a different lens, not as right or wrong. It wasn't better or worse. It was just different. And I began to realize how sheltered I was from the other people the way other people processed the world, moved in the world and understood our responsibilities to one another. Um, interacting with my wife's father, for example, who lost everything to Castro was heartbreaking. The heartache, the tears, the loss. You know, as a privileged white boy in America, this was the first time I encountered anything like that. So I tried to take up the example of my dad. I listened uh, to be shaped by their experiences. Listen in love, listen in love. The second big jolt for me was moving to Mississippi for seminary, that's graduate school for preachers, for those of you who don't know, with my now Cuban wife. It was the first time in my life that I felt like an outsider. I mean, in Mississippi, you could still be white and still be an outsider because you're not from there. The networks I had no access to, the assumptions about Floridians and Cubans, the culture I'd never been exposed to the blatant racism, frankly, and inequality, complete with uh, black women taking care of the white babies at the all white church that I attended. I tried to assimilate, I tried to fit in. The first time ever doing that in my life, my wife would be like, that's what I've been doing my whole life. But her racial experience in America has basically been white. But when she was discovered to be Cuban, she was seen as exotic. So all of these events, shaped me in profound ways. Throughout it all, I had the good fortune of a background that had white supremacists to black folks, to Cubans, to Vietnam War supporters, to Vietnam War protesters. And for some reason, we didn't seem to hate each other the way we do today. And for me, it was about listening and loving, and I think somehow saved me somehow from becoming a closed-minded curmudgeon. Now, I give you all that background because I think all of us are a book with many chapters. And those early chapters set a foundation for who I would become in my life. And they did for you too. This is why I think it's vitally important for you to be a student of your personal story. I mean, I'm not gonna go into the trauma of my upbringing. This isn't a deep dive into my own family system, but not all of my early chapters were rosy. But I got a good therapist for 12 years to untangle and unravel my story. And I could go on for hours right now explaining it. That self-exploration is critical, I think, to developing vulnerability and increasing your own capacity to believe that your vision is limited, that you aren't hearing the whole story unless you're hearing from those who've been muted or hurt, even erased. And often the first step in becoming a more expansive and generous person is learning how to become that way with yourself. So that's my basic background. Let's move forward to San Francisco. After six years in campus ministry, working with college students in Tennessee, I moved to San Francisco in 1996 to begin a new church. When we started City Church of San Francisco, we gathered a launch team. We came up with two foundational statements that honestly we've been working on for 25 years. The first foundational statement is, let's start a church you can bring your friends to. You just think about that for a minute, how much that changes how you think about 
what takes place on a Sunday morning. Every single week, we want it to be a good week for you to invite your friends. That means we don't want to embarrass you with saying stupid stuff. <laughs> we don't want to embarrass you with uh, straw man arguments, um, et cetera. But the second big idea is the one I want to emphasize tonight, and that is let's start a church that's good news for all of San Francisco. And it's that second statement that must be continually be interrogated by asking the simple question, who are we not good news for? That's a disruptive question. Those are sometimes the very best questions. It's very difficult to answer it satisfactorily. I and mean, we're still trying to answer it. And we gave ourselves a simple con concept to help us flesh that out. We called it an apologetic of listening. So early on, those first meetings with folks who were interested in our church, everything from naming our church, that was done through a poll of hundreds of people, um, to fashioning a worship service, all that was supposed to flow out of listening to the city. We saw San Francisco with all of its beauty and brokenness as a gift we could listen and learn from, even if it was listening and learning about the failures, which every city has them, certainly San Francisco does. I'm often asked how on earth we started a church we didn't know anyone when we moved there, but I just keep on telling people we tried to listen. I'd interview people, I'd ask them, what do you think a church would look like that shows that it understands San Francisco? And sometimes the jaws would drop, people would go, really? You're the first pastor I've ever talked to in my life that actually wanted my opinion about something. So I was inspired by the idea that a church didn't have to be a confirmation bias factory, but a place of questioning and inquiry and curiosity for whatever a person found themselves, wherever they found themselves on their personal journey. We expected people to be in our church from every conceivable background, especially when it came to religion. So we never talked inside baseball, as it were. We never assumed people understood anything about what we were talking about, Jesus, the church, the Bible, et cetera. It was come one, come all, and we will do our best to be comprehensive to everyone. That was kind of baked into our DNA. But we had some pretty conservative theological roots. I was a part of a tribe that was very conservative. I was working for reform within it without a lot of, not a lot of success. And so there were problems. The church got off the ground. We grew like wildfire. Within a few years, we're up to 300 people. Um, but my foundational questions were causing me heartburn. We were listening and we were loving and we weren't good news for women. The church, especially when we ordained elders and deacons, and women were left out of that, felt like a temple with walls, not a table for a shared meal. If you know a little bit about the ancient temple in Jerusalem, you know there were a number of courts, Gentiles, and uh, you know different levels of people, uh, priests only, men only, women only. And in Jesus, I see someone who included his background but transcended it as well. My foundation served me well. I didn't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Jesus respected his tradition while tearing down walls of separation within it. Jesus was about everybody. That's, that's actually a really traditional teaching. Jesus was about everybody. Men, women, Gentiles, sex workers, good people, bad people, tax collectors, everybody. Come sit at the table. What he called the kingdom of God or the reign of God is moving from a temple mentality of rituals and pecking orders and rigid hierarchy and rules and purity codes and who's who to well, let's have a meal. Everybody's invited. Sit down and eat. So after working for reform and trying to find a way through for women to be fully participating in the life of our congregation, but only getting in trouble with my particular denomination, in 2006, I broke from my tribe of 16 years, the PCA, the Presbyterian Church in America. I was scapegoated on blogs. Um, I remember my eldest child, John Mark, who's now 31, walking into the living room one night asking, Dad, do you know what people are saying about you online? <laughs> it's a very upsetting thing to hear from a child. <laughs> Thankfully, a lot of those have been pulled down, but they would be replaced nine years later. I'll talk about more on that in a second. 
But our church got 1,000% wiser the day we made that move. But we had to keep asking the question, are we being good news for all of San Francisco? And a new heartburn set in that was growing in me and in our leadership and in our church. We weren't really good news for the marginalized in San Francisco. We were largely a rich white church that had become insulated from communities of color, communities of need, communities of desperation. So we began to intentionally listen and lean into proximity. And the greatest, one of the greatest ways for us to be leaning into proximity was to start worship services in county jail. Um, we at one point had 18 services a month in county jail. And those were, those were ways for us to build relationships and to listen. I mean, I always said from the beginning that our theological foundation should be a home and not a prison. And from that vantage point, we were free to interrogate our theological foundations to see how they serve the poor and marginalized in our community. And it was all right there along, all in the tradition itself. It's not like you have to leave it to find it sometimes. Jesus obviously prioritized the poor. His first sermon in oh, Nazareth, which you can read about in Luke chapter 4, he says that he's coming to proclaim good news to the poor. People didn't like what he was saying. He almost got thrown off a cliff. I've stood at that very cliff where it was ported to where he'd be, where they were going to throw Jesus off of it, and he would have definitely died. But Jesus said, I'm here for the outsider, the prisoner, the stranger, the widow. If you don't love the least of these, you don't love me. Radical statement. It's not that we hadn't seen these things before. We just weren't applying them. And we weren't asking the hard question of how complicit we were in upholding the unjust systems behind them so often. So like I said, we dove into county jail. We saw their people who were uh, right back in the jail within a few months. We began to see people who once they got out of jail and they wanted to remain clean and start a new life, um, they might even be in rehab, but then we'd see them relapse. Um, so we created a mentoring program to walk alongside them. Um, so I had in my church at one point, I still do, I had Harvard MBA sitting right next to someone right out of jail that they're mentoring, helping to write a resume, building relationship and walking with them through life. In doing all of that, we accumulated a lot of wisdom because we were listening. We were listening to their stories. We we're finding out where the cracks in the system were. And so we eventually began something called City Hope Community Center, which is in the heart of the Tenderloin. Um, we can't build a house for everybody in San Francisco, but we can create a living room, a safe, social, sober living room that involves everything from recovery to uh, recovery groups to basic medical care to karaoke night, movie night, and Sunday afternoon football, and, and uh, you know, just all sorts of ways to build relationship. We also were able to acquire an SRO and start something called the City Hope House. And the reason we started that was because of our experience of listening. We would see someone who would get involved in, um, uh, in rehab and say they were on the sixth or seventh step of 12 and they're doing pretty well, but the only place they can afford somebody shooting up right outside the window. And so they relapse. And if you work with these communities, you know that relapse is incredibly dangerous and often leads to immediate death because people's bodies have adjusted and then they take an old load of the drug they used to take and then they go into cardiac arrest. And so we buried lots of folks along the way. Um, through our trials and tears, we learn where support was needed. So while all of those developments are great and they were really fantastic and I thank God for them and I think they've really helped a lot of people, they're still in this category of kind of doing things for people, but it's not the same as actually being aligned with them, to intentionally align ourselves with those who are being stigmatized. And this is where the rubber meets the road. And it happened for us in 2015. So part of my pastoral privilege is listening to the stories of many lives. It's one of the greatest things about being a pastor. And in San Francisco, many of those lives are LGBTQ. And listening to their stories and experiences began the process of changing my mind, which is a Bible word for that is repentance. 
metanoia, turning around, of how I was understanding them and what the good news of Jesus requires of me in our church. So here we were again, going back to the drawing board to say, the temple has not been torn down completely after all. Because with each story, the church was again feeling to me like a temple, not a table for a shared meal. I should also say that in 2010, my now 31-year-old son came out to me. Now, all of those stories I listened to were also now my own flesh and blood. So my son is one of my heroes. His courage, his authenticity, and his love for others is something I aspire to and can only hope to be like one day. And I mean that. And he was summarily executed by a Christian ministry, told he could never participate any longer because he was gay. That ministry is called Young Life. He was asked to not lead, to not be involved, just because he happened to be gay. And he hasn't returned to the church since. Not that he has any real problem with Jesus, mind you. And that part's instructive as well, if you want to understand the next generation. But in 2015, our church made a public statement in support of LGBTQ inclusion in all aspects of the church's life. We came out in our own way and shared the stigma of this group who have been so hurt by the church in particular. I mean, the statistics are staggering. Efforts to change people's sex orientation are not just ineffective, they are harmful. A 2018 study on conversion therapy found that LGBTQ youth whose parents, normally Christians doing it out of a Christian basis, tried to change their sexual orientation, were more than twice as likely to attempt suicide as LGBTQ youth whose parents did not try to change their orientation. LGBTQ youth were almost three times as likely to attempt suicide when they were also sent to therapists and religious leaders who sought to change their orientation. According to a landmark 2009 study, when families reject their LGBTQ children, their children are 8.4 times more likely to attempt suicide, 5.9 times more likely to have high levels of depression, and 3.4 times more likely to use illegal drugs than LGBTQ children who have supported families. A 2018 study found that while, religious, while religiosity helped to protect against suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts among heterosexual youth, it was associated with significantly higher rates of suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts among gay, lesbian, and questioning youth. Suicide rates are highest among transgender people. 41% of transgender adults in the United States have attempted suicide in their lifetime. 41% compared to only 1.6% of the overall population. The life expectancy of a trans person is somewhere around 33 to 35 years old. And just think of what the governor of Texas has just done. He's endangered the lives of every trans kid in the state of Texas. Sheer ignorance. Even when Christians' families seek to communicate to their LGBTQ children, that same-sex relationships are sinful in the most loving and supportive ways, the results will still be disastrous. So for taking that stand, I was scapegoated, I was rejected, I was scorned publicly and privately. In terms of our church, $3 million of our $6 million budget walked out the door of the church the day the letter went out that described our new policy about LGBTQ folks. We went from 1,000 people in worship to around 400. I lost hundreds of dear friends, people I baptized. I baptized their children. In some instances, I buried their children, tragically. I walked through hell and back with all sorts of those folks. I keep all my secrets. Of course, I, as a pastor, I'm duty-bound. I'll take them to the grave. But all these folks who had shared their lives with me so vulnerably, and in an instant, they were gone. And I can tell you, I grieve the loss of every one of them. Being ghosted by 400 people is a unique psychological event, to say the least. And I have to tell you, I've never been happier in ministry. Because the table's back. The temple's been further dismantled. Thanks be to God. When you include a group that has been rejected, it leads to more interrogation of where else this is happening. 
We're not just an inclusive church if we aren't also doing a deeper dive into white supremacy and its impact on our desire to be an inclusive church. So we now seek to listen to as broad a group of people as possible. During the 2020 summer of Black Lives Matter protests, a black friend told me, Fred, it's exhausting to be black in America. It's exhausting to do the labor for white people who don't see their complicity or how they run over me while they're trying to help me, how they center their voice when we need ours centered, when they repeat all lives matter when ours clearly don't. The strategy of oppression is exhaustion. So that's my story. There's some lessons, I think, that we can learn. In all these lessons, I'll be honest with you, are I'm hard on my former group of people. I'm hard on the modern white American evangelical church. The first lesson is this. Listening and loving is simple. It's hard, but it's simple. Listening and loving will create a healthy foundation for your life where it can be a home but not a prison because you're listening. And at its core is love to see the face of Jesus in every person you see and you talk to. When Jesus was asked to summarize the law and the prophets, it was all about love. I think the American evangelical church, the white evangelical church is far more interested in worshiping Jesus than in the actual ideas of Jesus. Just think about that. And the more you see it, the more you can't not see it. It's everywhere. More interested in worshiping Jesus than the actual ideas. So I think this is the case because of the way the evangelical church has had to prioritize an individualistic mindset and understanding of spirituality to frankly live with its guilt, its complicity in white supremacy. If the only question you're asking about yourself is, did I have a racist thought today? And if the answer is no, I'm fine. Nothing really changes in you or in this world. But if you ask a harder question, a deeper question about systems that are rigged to favor one group of people, people who look like me, over another, if you start to realize, like I did, that I was born on third base and I didn't hit a triple, that Jesus imperative of love demands that I do interrogation on not only how I benefit from the rigged system, but how others have been crushed by it. So the question is this, how will I use my power and privilege for the liberation of others? That becomes a better central question of what it means for me to follow Jesus. We root ourselves in a tradition so that we can improvise, not so that we can close the door and say, we've got it all figured out. No, so we can improvise, so we can work with nuance and change our mind. I mean, changing one's mind used to be seen as a positive thing, a sign of growth even. It's, it's kind of like the word compromise. That used to be a good thing, but in the Machiavellian, poli Machiavellian politics that we are sub being subjected to right now, we have no idea how to do compromise in a way that promotes life for the widest group of people. Like a light on the dashboard, if your foundation feels like a prison, you're being dehumanized, love is not at the core and change is needed. So the first lesson is listening and learning will create a healthy foundation. Second thing is listening and learning is a traditional Christian value. I mean, Jesus set up a spirituality that is ever evolving. Jesus said this in the book of John. He said, I have things you aren't ready to hear. I love that one. I love when he says, I have a lot of things to tell you. You just cannot handle it. Uh, but the spirit will lead you into all truth. That's the story of the church. From its earliest days when it was questioning Gentile inclusion to slavery, from our understanding of the cosmos to women's rights, from interracial marriage to divorce, and now the inclusion of LGBTQ folks, we have the Christian church, I'll speak for that, a long list of we were wrongs in our history. And this history of correction should remind us that at the base of our approach to scripture should be a loving humility 
that's always willing to hear Jesus say, you've heard it say, but I say unto you. In fact, epistemological humility is built into Christian spirituality. When someone like the Apostle Paul says, we see through a glass dimly, we should believe him because we do. So change comes by listening to the lived experiences of people. It's been my experience that that's how minds are usually changed. Listening and asking, what does love require here? And doing it, whether it benefits you or not, that's a path of liberation. And then thirdly, listening and loving will have you reject nationalism in all its forms. I think this is, of course, the great danger that we're seeing right now come across this country. Christian nationalism is the idolatrous conflation of Christian faith with American patriotism. Those under the sway of Christian nationalism essentially confuse America for the kingdom of God. The Bill of Rights is held as sacred as the Beatitudes, and the Second Amendment is revered as the Second Commandment, love your neighbors yourself. Baptismal identity is eclipsed by national identity, and right-wing politics overshadows the Sermon on the Mount. We sadly have a chilling, chilling modern-day example of this just in the past few weeks, when the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, tragically, and let's hope momentarily, sold his soul for nationalistic pride, blessing the bloodlust of a murderous dictator named Vladimir Putin. In fact, I was just reading today that on Sunday, a Russian Orthodox priest in a smaller town in Russia preached against the war and was arrested. Hmm. But it's happening here too. I mean, I don't place too much blame on rank and file American white Christians who have departed from the true faith of the idolatry of religious nationalism. They are, after all, the inevitable disciples created by 40 years of evangelical nationalism. I do blame, however, the pastors, the preachers, and the false prophets who have led the sheep down this disastrous path. Franklin Graham, Jerry Falwell Jr., Pat Robertson, Paula White, Robert Jeffries, and all the rest share a deep culpability in the distortion. Here's the thing, the distortion of the traditional Christian faith into the heresy of religious nationalism. They should know better. In fact, I think they do, but they've fallen in love with power. As a Christian, I am called to the peaceable way of the Lamb, regardless of who occupies 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. I mean, the kingdom of God is already among us. As followers of Jesus, we persuade by love, witness, spirit, reason, rhetoric, and if need be, my martyrdom, but never by force, never. I'm not going to do a history lesson with you of white American evangelicalism. <laughs> I've done enough already. <laughs> but for starters, I would suggest a book, Kristen Kobe Dumez's book. It's got a provocative title, Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. I was reminded of a quote by Barbara Brown Taylor, an Episcopal priest who's now largely retired and the occasional retreat speaker, but fantastic author. I can't can recommend her books enough. Barbara Brown Taylor. She said, Jesus was not brought down by atheism and anarchy. He was brought down by law and order allied with religion, which is always a deadly mix. Beware those who claim to know the mind of God and prepare to use force, if necessary, to make others conform. Beware those who cannot tell God's will from their own unquote. And then lastly, I'll stop here. Listening and loving is going to take courage. It means not necessarily just the ridicule of the outsider, but the ridicule from the insider, which I know you all have experienced. 
It was from within Jesus's tribe that he was persecuted. I mean, Jesus's death on the cross was a state-sanctioned, religiously endorsed lynching. And if you become serious about loving and listening, you might find yourself on an island in your own family system. Jesus certainly was at points in his life, they thought he was crazy. I mean, look, Jesus loved unity and peace. This is what people are going to say to you when you start to disrupt, when you start to stir the soup and disrupt the status quo. Be peaceful. Be unified. Don't cause problems. But Jesus, unfortunately, said he also came to bring division. In that, he would say the quiet part out loud. People would hear it differently. For some, it was words of relief. If you were under the yoke of Rome, the Roman Empire's oppression, if you were at the bottom of the totem pole of privilege, if you were a woman, if you were someone who had some kind of disease that made you unclean, if you were a peasant, Jesus' words were life. People felt seen. And if you were someone at the top, if you were someone who looked like me, frankly, those words were disruptive, necessarily, I would say, painful, but for everybody, liberative, the path of liberation. If we listen, if they would fight for the equality of all, the healing of all, if the good news is not good news for everyone, it's not good news for anyone. You know, as a Christian, I love to worship Jesus. As a human, I love to create a more beautiful world when I listen to Jesus' ideas. And I've got a long way to go, believe me. I remember early on in San Francisco, I was on a bus going up on the 38, like everybody rides the 38 in San Francisco, on Geary. And the guy, the guy asked me what I was doing, you know, how long you lived here, what are you trying to do with your life? And I told him, you know, starting a church and all that. He said, you know, if you Christians actually, actually took Jesus' ideas seriously, I'd be more interested in what you have to say. For example, here's an idea of Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, allow me to preach for just one second. This particular beatitude is the only beatitude that actually comes with an identity statement. Of all the characteristics Jesus describes in Matthew chapter five in the Beatitudes, peacemaker is the only one listed with an identity instead of a reward. Instead of being blessed, instead of being comforted or shown mercy, it says that peacemakers will be called children of God. And here's what I think. I think this means that we're never more like God than when we are peacemaking. Not peacekeeping, peacekeeping is is a good way to kind of skip the hard part, try to keep everybody happy all the time. Peacemaking, however, hard work. We're never more like God than when we are fighting for justice. We're never more like God than when we're bringing shalom, abundant goodness into every broken relationship and system in our world. And there's a huge temptation, as I've said, to be a peacekeeper right now, to not rock the boat or challenge the status quo. But that's not the way of Jesus. As a Christian, I must stand on the side of justice for all people and be the peacemakers that Jesus calls me to be. So, for this reason, you will find me in the political divide on the side of justice, equity, inclusion, diversity, and love. If the simplest and most, most important question a church can ask is, who are we not good news for in our community? When a community asks that question and is serious about it, anti-racism training is logical. Of course you do it. Interrogating white supremacy, absolutely, it's embraced. People leaving because you've made them uncomfortable, it's sad, but it's not debilitating. The work is thrilling. The good news for everyone, or it's not good news for every, every anyone, 
is the adventure I believe that Jesus invites people on. And trusting that will be the right of a lifetime. And lives will be saved. And whether you have any interest, interest in Jesus or not, like a lot of folks in my own congregation, don't have a lot of interest in Jesus. They just love what we're doing. So they're all in. So it might be that the best question a political party could ask as well. Who are we not good news for in our country? For me, that looks a lot more like a donkey than it does an elephant right now. But truly, my real interest is in following the lamb. That might not make me welcome with either of them, depending on the issue. But here I stand. Thank you for listening to my story. Hope it wasn't too boring. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you so much for that that beautiful talk, actually. It was very inspiring. Um, yeah. well, uh, we kind of want to open the floor to questions for you, if that's OK. And sure. if people raise their hand, then we can um, we can go on about it that way so that there isn't a bombardment of questions. Do we have any questions? Because I've got a few myself. Um, well, I mean, a lot of what you said uh, really spoke to me in some ways because um, I, I we come from a, a very like you said a conservative background similar to yourself mm -hmm. but in a, a way that it's a little different or maybe a little different and maybe closer to what your wife has experienced mm -hmm. is that um, to us and this is just coming from my view of it maybe others think of it a little differently our culture and our religion seem to have been one yeah. Uh, and it, the church has been a way for our culture to kind of stay together. And we could see it amongst people who are all over the political spectrum amongst us, where it's like, oh, I know I really don't agree with what the pastor is saying or anything like that, but I still feel like I identify with it. And it, it might be, sometimes it's the Jesus angle for some people. And sometimes it's just like, this is all I know. And this is my community. Mm -hmm. um, sure that kind of conflict arises. And I, I guess I just wanted your, I want to see what your experiences with that have been and how, how yeah. you kind of work through it. You know, I, I, no, it's, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's it. Yeah, I, I find that um, that's such a great question. I thought about that as I was preparing for tonight because I'm coming from a perspective that in some ways is uh, foreign um, to those who are in these cultures like yours where the, the keeping of and the preserving of the culture and the religion are very much together and woven together. Um, and so I don't have a lot of experience in that. So I'm the last person to tell you how to navigate that. I will say that, um, you know, in every movement, um, there tends to be a major tradition and a minor tradition. So for example, in Catholicism, um, I'm, I'm right now at a Franciscan retreat center, actually, in Scottsdale, Arizona, with a group of pastors and nonprofit leaders who are doing some really great work in the world and, frankly, need a break. Um, and, um, and so the entire Franciscan tradition is the minor tradition within the Western church. Um, and I don't know if in Orthodox circles, those kinds of things are tolerated or allowed. Um, but I know that when I've, I've spent some time in the West Bank on two different occasions and speaking with Palestinian Christians there and, and Palestinian Muslims. And I remember the first time I asked a Palestinian Christian, I said, when did you become a Christian? And he said, Pentecost, when do you think? <laughs> Which I just love that answer. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I think that it's harder, I would guess, in those circles to have a prophetic voice. You know, it's this kind of Jesus in some ways is your guide here. Jesus definitely was a, a critic from within. And that's a, you have a long tradition of respecting the critic from within the community. Um, I know in Jewish circles, um, I have some good Jewish friends who tell me that you know, when Jesus came along and said things like, Moses said to this, said this, but I say this, 
um, my rabbi friends say he's just being a good Jew. This is what we did. This is how this is how we work it out. And so I don't know. To add, I don't know is my basic answer, but I'm wondering if there's a place for you to be critics from within to spur on change. Um, but doing that is going to cost for sure. Yeah, definitely. Thank yeah. you. Um, we have a question from Nathan. You can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, uh, and this is Nathan. I just want to thank you for such a mesmerizing talk. I'm like feeling so overwhelmed. Like it's just like all this thought and feeling I had. You just put them there, you know, so mm. simple and so eloquent. Uh, you know, um, I, 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 you know, uh, well, I'm also like a Syrian, like from Iran. At some point, I really tried to be Christian and even get the second baptism. Wow. wow. And, a you lot know, of water. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. And, you know, I was kind of proud to be Christian and then, you know, uh, taught that, you know, Christianity and Jesus is where, you know, the humanity is. And then because like I'm coming from Iran and Muslims and, you know, yeah. the, the religion is like this and that, or God is different. And then I came here and after so many years, I just kind of lost, you know, lost my face in everything. You know, I still, you know, when you just look at Jesus, it's like, how can all these churches and priests and bishops be so wrong and it's just like sold out like you know the the essence of what Jesus is and then it's just like I lost my face I'm like I don't want to go to churches anymore I just don't want to hear these people and I'm so judgmental and so angry like um, because like like it's just like so I don't know <laughs> and I don't know what is like what can I do I'm like and I feel like I, I, as a mom, like when I don't have any more belief or faith, how can even I tell anything to my kids about that? Right. Sure. So uh, and I'm not sure, and it's very hard, and I don't know how you can do it, like what you're doing and what we can do. Like, like <laughs> I don't think I can belong to any churches anymore. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't blame you. There's so much abuse. It's so hypocritical. Um, I feel like I have a church full of people like you who are like, okay, I'm trying this church. It's the last time I'm ever trying a church. And what I hear repeatedly is, it's like I said about my son earlier, you know, he came out of the closet in, uh, when he was a sophomore at the University of Oregon. He was easily the best like Bible study leader. He worked with college, with high school students. He was the most committed volunteer. Um, there's a place in the Bible where Jesus describes a man named Nathaniel, and he said, he's a man in whom there is no guile. And that's my son, John Mark. He's just that way. I mean, all of his siblings would have sit here and say, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's not, I'm not crazy about this. He really is a pure hearted soul. And they just, they just cut him off. And, uh, so for John Mark and maybe you, uh, it's not. It's not necessarily Jesus that's the problem here. It's the church, and yeah. in this, the uh, it's just unworkable. So you know, um, what I tell folks in our congregation who say I I can't do the church, but I can do Jesus. I say, well, first of all, you don't have to come to church to 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 be a Christian. You don't have to. I mean, it's especially when it's so corrupt and so triggering for people. I mean, one of the things that's great about being online is people um, are so triggered and traumatized by walking into a worship service um, that, but they can they can join online and kind of peer in and feel like it's not quite as threatening feeling. Um, so if you can possibly try to find a community that's really just centered on that simple message I was just giving you. Yeah. listening and loving, standing with those on the outside, they're out there. Um, but the, the loudest mac microphone, um, you know, is unfortunately with, um, you know, white American evangelicalism, um, but it's also white American mainline. Yeah. It's not just the evangelicals. 
Um, yeah, it's not just white though. I mean, you can it, see the hypocrisy all right, around, like right. in all churches. I mean, yeah. it's in all churches or like the bishops, and like somebody just to kiss the hand and like- Like I just was talking yeah. about the guy of Russia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's always gonna be um, a real mix. And sometimes people lose patience with it, patience with it and I don't blame them. Yeah. The last thing so, I would do is condemn you for that or say you're wrong. I'm just like, I understand. It's a mess. But what about in San Jose Bay, like San Jose area? Do you know of a, like a church that you would recommend? <laughs> Good question. Um, so there's a church in, uh, in uh, like Palo Alto area called Spark Church, S P A R K. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be worth looking into. Um, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of, I don't think there's a lot of kind of progressive church options down there. But you know what, Tony, if you would just send me an email about that question, and I'll source out some more that I can't think off the top of my head. Okay, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. That was an amazing talk. Thank you. And you can, you know, a lot of you can join us every Sunday on at 10am on if you, if you have time for it, if you want to. Um, you can find us on YouTube or Facebook. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. That was a great, um, great answer. Thank you. Um, Sergon, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, hi, uh, Father. I'm not sure if you go with the name Father, too. Um, I get called but, Father all the time. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I actually align exactly with uh, Ramsina and Narin what uh, what they said. I, I come from the same background. Um, like growing up, it was always a Sunday church for me. I grew up basically very close uh, to our culture and and church mm -hmm. um, until I get married. Then my wife didn't really speak uh, our language that well, so we decided to try a evangelical church, which uh, I actually tried, and it was truly a, a fresh breath for me like I never went back again to our church because uh, that's what I thought church was basically listening to a language that I understand learn something like I walk in in there uh, learn something before I leave and not just move on with my life with the same like being there or not being there so um, and I really feel myself like close to um, like said the religion and Jesus and everything because uh, a lot of miracle happened in my life, and I thought it can be for no reason. It has to be something there that uh, are behind us. So um, my question was, um, again, now we're at, at the moment where everything's collapsing with the, with the politics involved and everything. So people start um, basically, um, uh, let's say, giving names that are like putting down and stuff like that. It, to where I was told, basically, um, because um, you follow a certain uh, political group uh, as a Democrat, uh, since therefore abortion and gay rights and all that, you're not you're really not a son of God. You're not you're not going to be saved. Uh, that was straight given to me at Facebook, and my wife just exploded at that person, and I respond. And it's not people that we know closely, hmm. so. Uh, so it, sorry, it, again, I'm I'm the same with Naren, where he said like I've been kind of pushed away from from churches. Um, mm. I still have big faith that I believe that uh, you know like I still in need of. Mm -hmm. uh, so my question is like, what? How did the church fail us uh, as as people that just like you explained, which was very inspiring for me, honestly. Um, where where. Like they, we preach, love your enemy and be good and and like help the poor and all that. And now we're at point where it's like we're we're looked at at a certain thing. You're for abortion. You're for gay, and mm -hmm. that's it. You're not being accepted at church. Why? Why is church uh, not really going back to that to that where where start where Jesus started it where we're accepting we we weren't not accepted by Jewish because we weren't born Jewish and Jesus came and spread that religion to everyone yeah why why is not being like is it just in the United States or it's in all the world right now where where this well, is taken over. And, yeah. and that that's basically, I don't know if it's a question or not, just wanted to hear from you about that. 
Well, I, I just would start by saying there's a book that I recommend for you that you saw, heard me talk about, um, Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Kube, um, Kobe Demaze. I think it's really, I, I, I think it's really important for those of you who um, grew up largely in another part of the world, and then you came to America, and then you ran into American evangelicalism. And because there's a lot of backstory that needs to be learned about that entire movement and how it has allied itself with white supremacy and power uh, throughout its history. And so she is an historian. Um, she's not just kind of given her opinion. I know all history is subjective to some degree, obviously, but she is an historian who does really good work. And I think that you will find that uh, really instructive as to the mess we're in today um, in particular. Because um, it's not just evangelicalism, it's also all the other branches that are impacted by it, um, as you all have experienced. Um, so that's one thing for sure, is to you know dig into that. There's another book by Anthea Butler called White Evangelical Racism. Um, also, these are just ways for you to tap in. But you know, a lot of people would answer your question this way. They would say, it all went south when Christianity allied itself with empire in the 300s with Constantinople, Constantine making it the official religion. That's when a lot of historians will say, that's when things went sideways, when religion allied itself with power. And instead of being the grassroots uh, movement that was countercultural, um, that was, um, that was risking its life on behalf of everyone. The Christianity you read about in some of the early, uh, early parts of the church where when plagues would happen, the, the Christians would run into the city to be with those who were dying and seek to rescue them. Um, you actually have early Christian historians, not Christian historians, um, um, you know, pagan historians, whatever you wanna call it from the Roman empire who would write that these crazy Christians, they not only love themselves their tribe but they love all the other tribes around them you know they're they're they take better care of our people than we do um and so that that original genius uh can still be mined and looked for but so a lot of folks would say that christianity's biggest issue has always been its addiction to being courting power um I think that's what happened here in the 1970s with Jerry Falwell and the moral majority and co-opting, you know, they literally tried, they, I mean, you have to understand the Southern Baptist Convention, the Southern Baptist Convention in the 1970s affirmed Roe v. Wade. And it wasn't until it was presented to them as a way of, co co of, of, creating a coalition of power that it suddenly became front and center of, as a topic. You would think that that's always been the case. That's not actually always been the case. You know, I could make a very good case. A traditional view on something like that has always been that there are two people involved here and one of them's already been born and she needs to have the priority and the privacy about what kind of decision she makes about her body. There's a long line of tradition in that way, Judaistic Christian thought. Now, I'm not here to debate that. We don't need to keep going on that. I don't want to turn that into it. But my point is, is that there's a lot of ways in which things have, things have been co-opted over the years that were literally all about fear mongering for the purpose of gaining power. And unfortunately, Followers of Jesus are not immune to any sin, <laughs> any bad decision making. And I do think that that's a lot of it, a lot of it. Uh, just like uh, what I was using during the election, um, a website, catholicvotersguide.com. It was amazing to me that something that simple that they put their 47 issues that Catholics should consider when they vote. Mm -hmm. And it was more actually very clear that the Biden and, and Harris were much more aligned than, than Trump and 
uh, whoever was running with them. And yeah. I, I started sending that link basically to not basically being political, but more basically as a Christian, you should be more open. Christianity is not about just those two issues. Christianity, even the Catholic Church on their own website here is telling you that that you should look for, from the Bible. It's not just two, it's 47 issues that mm -hmm. they looked at. And I'm not on the wrong side. You guys are on the wrong side. And that was, respond to me was, that's fake news. Mm -hmm. So you you can't win i think and and really i feel that the church need to continue pushing for those items when yeah. continue involving politics to where that that mentality and where the this generation or what what's growing in this country need to be a little bit slowed down and thank you very much again i was very inspired by your talk and i mm. hope we, uh, we listen to you a lot more often mm. thank you for that you know you're not the only one that feels that way you and the previous speaker as well because all the polls, all the statistics that's done right now, um, this next generation is is done. I mean, I, I tell, I had a person say to me back in 2015 when we did uh, LGBTQ inclusion, um, he was predisposed to staying, he wasn't leaving, but he was skeptical. And he said to me, what kind of church are you trying to build now? And I says, you know, and I didn't think about this response. It just kind of came out of my mouth. I said, I think it's the only kind of church your children will ever attend one day. <laughs> and he said, you know what? You are exactly right about that. Because the, uh, the next generation is done and all the stats are proving it. I mean, right now, the church is literally dying in this country. And the 82% and the of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump hastened its death. Wow, that is, that's a, something definitely to think about. Um, we have one ask more my question? question? Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Reverend Harald. That really was a very inspiring uh, presentation talk. Um, so, you know, we talked before, you know, uh, in the past two years, you know, we were part of the actually Assyrian evangelical church here in right. San Jose. Right. But then we haven't gone there because kind of uh, in a way we got demoralized with the things that happened, right, in the past, especially it was maybe it wasn't clear before, but it kind of become more intensified. Then we kind of come up with creating this group, even though it's like a political group, but really it's a forum, right? We want to talk about a lot of things, including spirituality, religion, those kind of things. And a lot of people have been contacting me, you know, they, you know, there are a lot of people in our community, they have kind of failed, they are being ostracized because like they have an open uh, gay child, even mm -hmm. though, so they don't know really, they also they are like a, a, a lady had called because she doesn't know what to do, how to handle this issue, kind of right, right. what to do. So that's so. Uh, so we created this group at least to forum to this. Uh, so I, I want to see your opinion. So really, what is the course of action for us? Because we kind of right now a lot of us don't feel that we have a space to go to. So either we have to kind of proactively change the space, create other spaces for people like us, or you know how can we challenge the mainstream? Uh, because you know again the, because the churches are part of the community it's not just a place of uh, worship it's kind of it's more than that it's kind of where right. people gather connect those so, so really so i really i am myself confused so we created this group which is a secular group it's not a religious group but also right. we kind of have to address those issues too so i want to know what your opinion is on that well i can tell you what um i can tell you what's going on in the uh what's called the ex-evangelical or post-evangelical world that's more um, um, situated positionally within just white America. Um, you know, there are those who say, I, I feel like I'm called to stay in my church. Oh, did I unmute? You muted me. You didn't like what I was saying, huh? <laughs> Sorry, I, I want to uh, 
<laughs> unmute the uh, R key because there was some. Sorry about that. No, no problem. There, there are, uh, there are. Um, I, I was saying that we, I can tell you what's happening in the in the ex evangelical or post evangelical world of white America. Um, those there are those that feel called to stay in their churches and work for reform. So I, I get conversations like this a lot. People call me and they say, "Look, I can't stay in this. I, I can't stand my church right now because they." are actively harming LGBTQ folks by not accepting them. Um, but I feel called to stay and to work for change. So that's extremely difficult to do. It's not to say you shouldn't, but it's hard to do. It doesn't always result in change. It very often doesn't. And so what I tell people in that situation, I'm like, okay, fine. If you feel called to that, who am I to tell you not to? Um, but What's your strategy and what's your timeline? Because often people will do that because they just, they just want, they just like the music, you know, or they just like this or that. But at some point, you know, when I tell them you have to have a strategy and a timeline, that means that you're giving yourself um, a more serious approach to say, this could end in me leaving as much as that would hurt. Um, so I make I try to make people to be a little more sober-minded about it in the press. Um, the other thing people are doing is, is they're creating new communities. New communities that are safe, new communities that are um, not as glitzy, not as uh, highbrow, not as well-funded for sure. Um, but that are communities where they can process with one another. It's kind of what you're doing here, frankly, where they can process with one another. And um, if they're a faith community, to continue their faith, to see if they can have a new way of expressing it. So what that's called is deconstruction. So there's a lot of people going through deconstruction um, in my church. Um, I've gone through deconstruction as well. Um, to have a much more generous and open expression of Christian faith. It's hard to do that when you're the pastor because some people don't like it. And oftentimes I'll make a change on something and I don't know how to defend it. I just know it's true. You know, you ever know that? I mean, some people are just more intuitive. That's, that's who I am. If you ever do Myers-Briggs, I have a very high N. Um, so um, the starting of new communities um, is a long tradition within most faith communities, not just Christian. It's not as fun. It's not easy. It's not, it's not, it's not the greatest thing. And I know that you are also, you know, your religion has been a way for you to preserve your culture, which I completely um, sympathize. I don't understand it. Don't, don't pretend to, but I understand what you've told me and I've seen this with others. And so that, that can be a form of what takes place also in these smaller gatherings. But there are a lot of small deconstructing churches in America right now, and they are really doing good work. And uh, they've been a great outlet for people who feel like to, to continue attending the church they were at would mean they would be complicit in some kind of injustice they can't abide. And so those are kind of your choices, it feels like to me. And don't, don't give yourself a hard time if you just don't know what to do, but you know you need a break. There's no problem with that. That's a good strategy as well. So it looks like we really, our community also needs sort of reformed churches, right? Kind of so right. people... Totally. Uh, yeah can when that would happen no but also i see the need that that should happen you know there's one uh, slogan of the reformation that's always forgotten um but it's ever reforming and so the church should always be reforming itself we've never got it all figured out city church san francisco didn't have it all figured out i can tell you that yeah. and this is why i say every sunday that um in the welcome portion of our service i say city church aspires to be an inclusive community of Jesus followers seeking the good of the city because we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. A lot of work. Here, 
those are great words, especially pointing out how hard it is to sometimes that you have to build something on your own and how hard it is to do something like that. It really does. In it's the hard. end, I think that's the right thing to do. And we have uh, one more question from Walter. Yes, hi. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Reverend Harold. Yes. Um, so um, it's a question, it's a kind of more observation and comment, uh, really. It's, it's about Assyrian Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of, we were one of the early Christians, and, and, and along yes. the way, we've been converted many times. You know, my father was Catholic, my mother was kind of Pentecostal, and so we, we kind of grew up a little bit differently. But, you know, the church is sort of Christianity in, in Middle East wasn't, wasn't kind of like on its own, basically on its own, running on its own merit. It was alongside of something else, which was basically at that time, majority of people thought Islam was a threat. And so that, in that kind of context, the Christianity became something different, it became a group sort of huddling together and, and surviving, uh, yeah. protecting, surviving, yes. In fact, um, some years ago, um, I, I, I was I kind of talking to a Polish, I was in delicatessen, say, what was it like after, you know, um, communism? And he said, well, you know, uh, before communism, people were uh, having church, underground churches, they were really secretly all very religious. As soon as that was free, they just let it go. And so for us, uh, you know, coming here, leaving the Middle East and, and living in, in somewhere with that threat, we assume threat, I guess it wasn't always the threat, but it was assumed threat, is no longer there. So now, basically, we don't have that religion where we're trying to protect ourselves because that no longer exists, those, those walls no longer exist. And so, uh, you know, have, our churches have to find a different way of uh, you know, being a church. And, and the religion in our churches has been kind of more, um, it hasn't been in the kind of discussion, sort of having less have a talk about something. It's been more of a sort of a faith religion. You know, you can't, you have to bow and, you know, you don't sort of smile, you don't laugh. It's that kind of sort of activity. So I, I think that's where we have to relearn you know, that's, that's kind of the problem here. There's the mm -hmm. relearning re how to sort of, you know, um, how to go to church and how to operate churches. Just basically that was a more comment mm -hmm. observation, yeah. No, I mean, I, it brings up a very interesting point, which is, you know, the church um, apparently um, does better under duress. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a certain amount of purifying of our intentions. Um, it's almost like all of us individually as well. We all of a sudden find ourselves praying whenever we have a big problem. We thought we were done with prayer, but suddenly we aren't. Uh, and, you know, all the great spiritual teachers, no matter what the um, religion, um, certainly within Christianity as well, um, you know, they will say that the great teachers, um, the way that we break through kind of into um, a deeper and more expansive understanding of ourselves in the world and the way we actually grow and change is through either deep love or deep pain. And normally it's deep pain. And um, thankfully um, we, we cling and try to hold on to the idea that as Franciscan priest Richard Rohr says, God doesn't waste pain, um, but apply that collectively. It feels to me that um, the church under duress is forced to purify and to simplify and to get, to get things down to the bottom line. Things like God loves us all. God, God sees us and hears us in our cry, you know. Um, you know, I, th I think also in terms of, uh, you know, people have moved on a little bit. So I think the idea of heaven and hell and, being sure. kind of, you know, yeah. that really sort of, it doesn't apply anymore. And, and right. people kind of not 
there's not something where people to bring them to church. It has to be something more. It has to be an understanding of people, mm -hmm. what you know, what's happening in the world, and, and so on. And I mean, you know, the politics obviously kind of taken over churches now mm -hmm. because the the, the right wing is are making kind of making it look like left wing, basically closing churches, and and people haven't done enough to to say no, that is not true, you know, and and so on. So and some of the issues that go into churches, for instance, I don't know, abortion and, and so on. I mean, you know, they should be, a, they should be a, a common kind of, uh, uh, an area of common kind of participation, not just one, one group or the other. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I, basically I think for people to be drawn in, it, it needs to be connecting with, with the new mindset, the new th thoughts. Yeah. I agree. I have, a, I have a friend who wrote a blog yesterday or a couple of days ago. Um, he's kind of a deconstructing pastor, but he he basically said, well, along the lines of what you're saying, is that um, evangelicalism is on its way to die because it's not good news for anybody anymore. And uh, he said, um, people who love the wrong gender are going to hell. People who love God the wrong way are going to hell. People with the wrong gender are going to hell. People who don't believe the right list of doctrines are going to hell. Women who dare to speak in church are going to hell. Anyone who questions the Bible is going to hell. Anyone who brings up racism is a troublemaker and should be silenced. Anyone who's so desperate they flee their home for the chance at a better life in another country is a criminal, rapist, murderer, or drug dealer. Anyone who follows a different faith is a potential terrorist and doomed to hell. Anyone who's poor has only themselves to blame and should pull themselves up by their own bootstraps instead of relying on others for help. Medical care is only for those who can afford it. The planet is ours to destroy. And then he says, how exactly is any of that good news? Right, it isn't. No, it's not good news. That's such a powerful blog. I wanna please share it. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll send it to you, Tony. You can, you can send it around. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, all right, then. Um, yeah. I think we have one more question from Paul. Yes. Thank you for your inputs. Mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe that you already uh, know about those uh, very famous verses that are in the Bible that these churches use to attack right. homosexuality. Yes. And also abortion. Yes. So this is not something that they are, they have created by themselves. This is existing verses that is very holy to the, the majority of, of Christians. Yeah. The thing is that uh, there are so many things that have been revised in, in Bible during this many centuries. Yes. But not these two verses. They are also like a very sharp tools and they can use it anytime that they want for like on, weapon. on anybody, yeah. on any nation. So in your position, in your new, new, new mind, new thoughts, what do you think that the progressive Christian who believes in purity of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. not on surrounding um, what happened at that time, there are not many progressive churches that that dare to go that way. Because either you want to go to that way, you have to eliminate some of these verses. Don't don't mention them. Just yeah. just delete them. Yeah. Or you cannot live in two worlds. Accept the, those verses and then do something else. Right. What what is your position? What is that you do you think that you can debate with this church is because they have very strong tool to debate. Right. So boy, you have brought up such a important point, which is, and I just preached on this a few weeks ago, which is how we read our holy texts has become a nightmare because we have not always read them the way we're reading them today. We have not always read the Bible as if it were a, a manual. Um, as if it were a flat text. I mean, the Bible corrects itself all the time. <laughs> and we have turned the Bible into a manual. And when you treat it that way, you will turn it into a weapon for sure. 
But uh, I mean, just going into the Old Testament, just look at the Hebrew scriptures. I mean, you have, um, you know, you have in one uh, author, Nineveh is all going to hell. And then you have Jonah coming after that to correct Nahum, basically. You know, you have a, you have an historical book that says, oh, when that guy was told by God to go wipe out the entire royal family, including all the women and children, et cetera, that was, that was God's doing, and it was great. And then only a hundred or a few hundred years later, people are, you know, you have someone come along and go, actually, that was horrible and a disaster. And so I could do this all day. I mean, you have Moses who is saying that God wants sacrifice, and then you have the psalmist and the prophet Hosea saying God desires mercy, not sacrifice. And of course, Jesus seconds that <laughs> with his own words in the New Testament. So the Bible is a text in travail. Um, American Christians and Christians in general tend not to read the Bible the way that our Jewish siblings have always read it, which that it is a text in travail um, and that is, while authoritative, to be read with an open mind. And I'll tell you why that's so important. Right out of the gate, I mean, basically, the whole New Testament is about an argument. And the argument is, what do we do with Gentiles? Okay, that's really what most of the New Testament is about, that debate. And you know how they solved that debate? They didn't point to Bible verses. They pointed to the fruit of the Spirit in Gentiles' lives. And they got together in Acts 15, and they said, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Pretty risky feeling, pretty subjective, actually. But they had plenty of clobber verses to use on those Gentiles that very clearly say they have nothing to do with what God's doing in this world. All sorts of Hebrew scriptures to use. But they had to listen to the people right in front of them. And they had to remember that Jesus said, I've got a lot to tell you, but you're not ready to hear, and the Spirit will lead you into all truth. And so um, I think right out of the gate, what Jesus established was not... Um, our, our goal as Christians is not to be biblical. It's to be Christ-like. The Apostle Paul says it, to be conformed to the image of his son. Mm -hmm. So God did not send us a book. A book was not up on the cross. A person was. And I find it much harder to use the Bible as a weapon when I put my goal to be Christ-like instead of biblical. Because if you want me to be biblical, well, I can make the Bible dance a jig for me, believe me. I, I can justify genocide. I can justify the subjugation of women. I can justify slavery. And people have used the Bible to do it. And I'm sure the uh, Metropolitan uh, Kirill of the Russian, Russian Orthodox Church is maybe finding him some Bible verses that he's used that way, but he's not thinking about what it means to be Christ-like because he'd be saying like Jesus put that sword down as Jesus said to Peter. So I think that, that, that we get off the way that we read that holy text. If it's a closed text like golden plates that fell out of the sky, then it's going to get weaponized and people are going to be hurt. Uh, but if the goal is to be Christ-like, then um, we have a very different approach. Now, we're not going to do it right now, but you know, it also has to be read in context. It has to be read as the difficult document that it is. That's a way of honoring the Bible, actually, is to say, oh, yeah, there's like different accounts of the resurrection and different accounts of that. So what's up with that? In my opinion, it makes the Bible more inspiring um, as you learn what first century authors were actually trying to do with it. But what we expect the Bible to be and what the Bible actually is 
are two entirely different things. I now I've gone into preaching, so sorry. <laughs> we are on eight thirty. Ramsina, you want to close it up or? Oh yeah, absolutely. I I do want to see if anyone else has any more questions. No one has their hands up, but maybe anyone wants to jump in or not. Thank you so much. Maybe we we'll give uh, Reverend one more last word to wrap yeah, it up. Yeah, huh? yeah. And definitely. Um, any any last words that you may have. Um, and, and I just want to say thank you for joining us. This was yeah. been a really insightful and, and inspiring conversation. Well, this is so enriching for me because. You know, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm a curious person. I can't help myself. And um, I, I'm, I'm talking with people whose experience of faith goes back to the first century. And is it's, and you too are actually saying some of the exact same things that I am hearing people say in my church all the time. They're coming in, they're saying, I've been at a church where the Bible was weaponized, or I was, I've had an experience where I've lost half my family because they all started voting for Trump and I couldn't believe my eyes. And I mean, I just want you to know you're not alone. This is, this is what a lot of pastors um, who have not been kind of co-opted into the GOP's um, idolatrous nationalism, um, you know, are doing right now. And um, good on you for being honest about it. Uh, be compassionate with yourselves. Um, this is a massive, must feel like such a disruptive curveball um, as it does for me personally. And uh, I'll definitely give Tony some books and things like that if you want to start digging into trying to figure out a different way of understanding your faith that might um, just be a little more loving and generous and Christ-like. I'm happy to do that. But thank you for having me. It's been an honor to spend this time with you.